Welcome, everyone, to another edition of 45 Forward, where our mission is to help our listeners from Los Angeles to Long Island make your second half of life even better than the first. Several years ago, John Leland, a reporter for The New York Times, wrote a series of articles following six men and women for a year, chronicling how people in one of America's fastest growing demographic groups, those 85 and older, led their lives. The series became the basis for his book, Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old which became a Times bestseller. And as he wrote in the Times, no work I've ever done has brought me so, as much joy and hope or changed my outlook on life as profoundly. In today's episode, John talks about his experiences writing this remarkable, hopeful, and often surprising book and the enduring lessons he learned from our pursuit of happiness. Certainly the examination of happiness in today's frenetic society has become a frequent topic in recent years, the source of best-selling books, the wildly popular courses at colleges like Yale and Harvard, as well as the massive online course provider Coursera. But John's unique perspective explores what sociologists often point to as the paradox of aging. How can people whose bodies and minds are in decline be happier than those in the so-called prime of life? And explain what happiness means, relating it to a sense of fulfillment and purpose, how a positive attitude can help contribute to overall health and longevity, as he takes us along his heartfelt journey with these elders, John talks about the role of gratitude, fostering happiness, how older people find happiness alongside great pain, and how to live in the moment, still thinking about living long, but not forever. John, who previously dubbed himself as a chronic grumpasaurus, offers a valuable collection of lessons he learned from the old as old, noting that, that many of the good things in life, whether we're young or old, are there all along. We just need to choose them. So now let's meet today's guest, John Leland. John, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Oh, Ron, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. You're quite welcome. Just really great to have you. So, John, I, so in the introduction, I gave a little bit of a background about um, how the book came about. But you know, give us a little bit more about the origin story, about how you developed the series. So you mentioned I'm a, I'm a reporter at the New York Times. In 2015, I had this idea I would follow six people over the age of 85 for a year. Just, and, and, and just write about like what happened in their lives. And what I thought going into it was that I would be writing about the ravages of old age because, you know, what else was there to right. say about it? And I thought I'd, you know, one month I'd be writing about somebody losing their memory and then their life went to hell. And then the next month I would do somebody fell and their life went in a downward spiral. And the next month I would do somebody who uh, became socially isolated and their life went into a downward spiral. And the, the problem with those stories is I, I kind of knew where they would go. I didn't need, you know, I didn't need to report them out. All the, all the questions we can, can uh, ask about them, we know the answers to. So I had the, the good fortune uh, of having some license at the times to just go talk to people and ask them about what their lives were like and just treat them rather than the, the gerontologists and the uh, you know, academically credentialed people who we normally think of as the experts, think about the people who were actually living it as the true experts, to, to just take the idea that somebody who's 87 knows more about being 87 than his or her doctor does. Right. I think, you know, when, when in our previous conversations, you mentioned that, you know, our views of, uh, you know, the oldest old are from the perspective of people who aren't there. You know? And so you wanted to um, get it from their perspective, which I think is great. And I think that you're absolutely right. You know, having had a, you know, a career in journalism myself, I think we often, what we do in stories is we look for an issue or look for a topic. And then we, then we look for people to populate the topic with anecdotes. Whereas you were, you know, it's, it's, it's great that you had an opportunity just to say, well, let's see what happens. Let's see what their lives to reveal. So, so what came out of this was sort of an encapsulation on, uh, you know, centered around the notion of happiness. So why don't we talk about that first? But so what is, what is your notion of happiness? I'm sure there are many different definitions and you kind of parsed it out through different um, uh, people in the book, sort of taking different pieces for different people. I think happiness in the very simplest way is spending enough of our time and our energy on things that have some sort of meaning to us, that matter to us. And if you think of happiness in that simple way, uh, not in terms of getting that new toy you wanted or you know, uh, uh, the sort of sugar rush that comes from these momentary 
moments of elation, which are fantastically powerful. Right. But but just having this uh, having a sense of meaning in your life that you're here for a reason, or that your your life matters, and that the things you're doing matter, that the people you're around are the people, you'd, for the most part, that you'd like to be around. And, and so uh, you know, we have many no, different notions of happiness in our culture. And as I mentioned, one is that sugar rush. We could say, gosh, I was really happy at three o'clock yesterday. Or we can say, my 60s were the happiest time of my life. And what we mean by happiness in, in those two uh, cases is very, very different. You know, one really is that momentary elation. Right. And the other is more uh, life satisfaction or contentment. Yeah, I think it's more sustaining. I mean, I, I was thinking the other day about how many instances, you know, we, we our culture as, you know, happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy holidays, <laughs> all these happy things, almost like you will be forced in these periods of elation, you know, we must be happy. But what you're talking about is, I think, more of a sustainable kind of, in some ways, more profound sense of meaning in your life that, that carries you through, not just these moments of elation. And I think it's located differently. Uh, th those kind of moments of elation are often located in the circumstances. Something good happened in our lives. And the, the sort of greater contentment, my 20s were a really happy period, uh, you know, have to do with the way we approach our days and our time in that period. Right. right. So it's something, it's more that, that kind of contentment and really kind of brought longer happiness is uh, is more internal than external yeah yeah and i think you mentioned uh, you know and especially some of your um people you profile and you know a man named fred for example you know that you you point that that um you know individuals are able to look at at sustaining this feeling of meaning um in spite of obstacles you know it's they're side by side they're, and they don't stop you from being happy well, yeah, let me tell you about Fred Jones. Yeah, I brought him up. You know, Fred was, I think, 86 when I met him. Uh, he was living alone in a, a two story walk up apartment, and he was in the process of losing two toes to gangrene. His closest daughter was dying of breast cancer. He had a heart condition. So Fred kind of checked all the boxes for elderly misery, right? <laughs> right. Bad health, socially isolated, uh, constant chronic pain when he went up and down the steps. And I asked Fred, what was the best period of his life? And Fred said, right now. And it was fascinating to me. But, but I've spoken to audiences a little bit since the book came out. And whenever it's an older audience, I'll say, you know, and what do you think Fred said? And, and if it's an older audience, they'll always say, right now. Really? Because they kind of understand that. And if it's a younger audience, they'll say, oh, you know, the first time I had sex, you know, there'll be something, you know, it'll, it'll be very, very different. That's their perspective on it. And so, I, again, you know, the, the younger audience is kind of thinking it's that circumstantial happiness, something great happened in my life. Right. And, right. and the older folks are, you know, that sense of, of living fully right now. What does right. it mean to live fully right now? And Fred was great about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I asked Fred, you know, just to understand Fred better, asked him what he meant by happiness. And he said, happiness to me is what's happening now. It's not the next world. It's not the dance you're going to tonight. If you're not happy now, you're not happy. Mm. And, you know, that's perfect. That's, yeah. you know, we talk about living in the moment, which is, uh, you know, it's A, a cliche, and, and B, for me, hard to understand. But well, as I spent more more time with Fred, I could see what it looked like to live it, and I could understand it better that way. Right. Unfortunately, the words I use are still this kind of the same words that you see on the Hallmark card, but <laughs> it was a difference seeing it lived out, and and that's what I tried to convey to readers in the book. Happiness is a choice you make to show what these values, which are very simple, and we all know them, right. what they look like when they're lived out. Right, right. Well, let's look at some of these values. Some, now you've, uh, so one of them you talk about quite a bit is the issue of gratitude, you know, and, and what the relationship is between gratitude and happiness. There's such an incredible amount of research on gratitude in the last 20, 30 years, right. uh, showing that, that, that people who just make a regular practice of, of saying something that they give thanks for 
you know, they sleep better, they have uh, uh, lower levels of stress hormones. Right. They say they're more optimistic about the world. And uh, when I started to read this research, it kind of pissed me off because I thought, how can it be that mechanical? Shouldn't these things come to you naturally? Shouldn't, you know, how can just, you know, saying something you're grateful for on demand, uh, how can that work like that? Shouldn't it be something that wells up in you spontaneously? And you look at the research and the researchers say, well, your body doesn't know the difference. The, <laughs> the neurochemical processes are the same, whether you come by that gratitude spontaneously or, you know, you set an alarm on your watch to remind you right. it's 11 o'clock today. What are you grateful for? Yeah. And I think that one of the things that you pointed to is that, you know, certainly and you sort of see it more in, in the, just the, the daily culture. I mean, even things, in, you know, in, you know, when I, I, when I watch a baseball game, you know, and somebody, a um, player, it's a home run or something, they cross the plate, they, you know, they point to the sky almost, you know, kind of in a, you know, a symbolic, you know, I'm grateful for the, my abilities and, and I, you know, thank my creator and so forth. But you also talk about it sort of in a different way, you know, relationally, that the gratitude is not just um, often about, you know, your circumstances, but it's in relation to people in your life. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, in, in two ways, of course. One is just understanding how grateful I am to be speaking to you right now. But also to tell you, thank you, Ron. I'm so glad that you gave me this opportunity to be on the show. And it, you know, when we do that in life, uh, it, it changes our relationships with the people around us. It's, it's an opening. Right. And, you know, if you, if you get nothing out of our, in our talk, you know, just say thank you say you're welcome to people, say, I forgive you, say, would you please forgive me? Say, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm sorry I did this. And uh, when we do that, we're not competing with people, we're not fighting with them, we're, we're letting down our, our guards, we're making ourselves vulnerable to them. Uh, you know, it opens doors for all sorts of good things to happen. Right, right, right. Um, an another thing that, uh, not that, uh, an element, not the same as gratitude, but an element to, to contend with, you know, in, in alongside, um, in, in conjunction with happiness, is how do we maintain this sense uh, in the face of loss and hardship, which is another theme I think, you know, came up. And, and you, you know, you, I think you deal with this straightforwardly, like recognizing these are things happening to these people and how do they handle it? I, I wanted to make no bones about that, that these lives can be very hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, getting old has its rewards, but it, it also has its punishments. And we give up things that we thought we could never give up. And we thought that life wouldn't be worth living without them. And luckily, we find out that it is, is worth living without, without them. And, and I think that the people I spent time with, the, the six of them, both for the time series and for the book, uh, all found different ways of balancing you know, their, their regrets over the things that they couldn't do anymore, their lamentation over that, and uh, their fully embrace of the things that they could still do, and the extent that they could just focus on those and live for those. Right. Yeah, I think that that came through about, you know, um, uh, I think in one point in the book, you say that uh, um, basically, you know, except, it was about accepting obstacles and set parts and setbacks as part of life, you know, so it's, uh, it's uh, happiness is not found in the absence of pain or loss, but in their acceptance. Um, and I, and I think that, um, you know, that that's sometimes hard to do because you, one other thing you point out too, is the notion of loss aversion, that we still have this happiness yeah. tendency to worry more about things we're losing. Yeah. But, you know, if we think we'll be happy as soon as all our problems are solved, we're never going to be happy. You know, it's just, we'll make up new ones. Uh, even if the ours are solved, right? <laughs> but it, it's it's hard sometimes to you know to recognize that. But I think it's an a, you know an important um, you know ability to um, to sort of balance that. And, and you know, I, I guess it's a matter of sort of a, of readjusting expectations too, right? Yeah. That, that this is and and a happy life includes grief and loss and pain. Because every life includes grief and loss and pain, right? But it helps to think that those things are just ordinary parts of life, and not these vindictive punishments that we are singled out for, and we alone are. Right, right, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, another one of your um, um, folks you talked to was um, uh, a woman named Ping who uh, talked about, you know, sort of uh, being flexible, <laughs> being able to recalibrate as things change. Right. I mean, that's one of the, the issues of, of, uh, of, of not, try and stay firm to expectations that will inevitably change. Uh, Ping was so great because she had been a traveler all her life and she put a lot of stock in, in her travels and now she couldn't travel anymore. And by the time I met her, she was starting to lose the ability to leave her apartment other than, or to leave the building and go outside. So she had to make these adjustments and it would have been very easy for her to brood over the things that she couldn't do. She couldn't travel anymore. She, she couldn't you know, go to see her family in China who were there. And instead of doing that, she made the most of what she could do. She, she played mahjong every day with the same three Chinese women in her building who were from the same province as her and spoke the same dialect. And most importantly, played mahjong the same way. Because later on, when she had to go to a nursing home, people for, were from different provinces and they played different versions of Mahjong right. and it threw her off. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I think that one of the things you, you talk about too is just being um, satisfied or accepting the things we have, not the things we don't have all the time, and it, which is hard for us to do. I think we, we are kind of in an aspirational society, you know, where, um, you know, part of what drives us in our culture is like, especially our consumer culture is aspiring for things that we don't have and wish we have. And, um, and you know, in some cases that's fine, but in some cases it becomes uh, almost a longing, you know, uh, for, for things that aren't going to be. So, um, you know, I think that that's something uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about. Um, but I think, uh, I think what we're going to do right now, John, is we're going to take a short break. Okay, but for folks out there, uh, much more to come with John Leland, the author and reporter for the New York Times, uh, who was the author of Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old. So don't go away, much more to come. Welcome back, folks. We're talking today with John Leland, the author of Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old. Uh, before I continue my conversation with John, I, I just want to mention you. Uh, you can buy his book on Amazon. Uh, he's also the author of two pre also in interesting books called Hip the History and Why Kar Kerouac Matters. And, and if you go to my website, roelresources.com and click on the 45 forward tab, you can see more about John on there at the top of the, uh, of the, the area, as well as you can get the link to his latest article, which is the concluding piece, which was just published a few days ago in the Times, uh, following the um, passing of uh, the last of his six. So why don't you talk about that, John, in terms of, you know, let's talk about some of the women that you've also uh, were um, uh, privileged to share their lives and to write about them. Well, you mentioned the, the last of the six right. died on Christmas Eve of last year, of, of 2021. And uh, she had been the, the sole survivor for a fair bit of time now. Mm -hmm. And her name is Ruth Willig, and she lived in Sheep's Head Bay in Brooklyn. And at 90, she had been forced to move out of her assisted living building in Park Slope in Brooklyn because the owner wanted to sell it for luxury condos. So there at 90, she has to start all over again, leave all her friends behind, uh, find a new place to live in a strange neighborhood far from her daughter who had lived next door to the other place. And it was a tough adjustment for Ruth. And over the years, she finally, I think, made her peace with the home. But we talked a little bit earlier about focusing on what was important. And what was important to Ruth was time with her children. She really didn't care. She cared about her independence and her autonomy. And she cared about time with her children. And some of the other stuff was, uh, you know, not so important to her. So she had the, the joy of giving up certain things that we, as we get older, can give up. She wasn't fancy about her appearance. She always looked great, but, but she wasn't fancy about that. Uh, she didn't uh, get involved in the sort of uh, politics of the building that she was living in. She focused on that time with her kids. And she, she made a role for herself in, in there as she became the matriarch of the family because she was the last of her generation. 
She had been the, the youngest of four, four siblings, and now she was the oldest. Right, right. And, and you know, I mentioned that what, what was important to Ruth was her independence. Uh, you know, we have this idea in America that we should be, uh, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, you know, be independent, stand on your own two feet. And it doesn't work at the beginning of life. It doesn't really work so well at the end of life. But whenever Ruth would accept any sort of help from her children, she felt in some ways compromised or diminished by it. So independent, you want independence, independence bumps up against your limitations. What do you do? And, and what Ruth did that I think was so great and her family did was to replace that idea of independence, not entirely, but partly uh, with the idea of interdependence. She could do things for her children and that meant she wasn't diminished by her letting them do things for her. So what did she do for her, for them? She was the matriarch. She was the only one who was in touch with all the branches of the family. She was the only one that could remember that time we went to Coney Island and, you know, and, and such and such happened. So she, she grew into that role. And therefore, you know, she was getting something from her kids. She was giving something to her kids and, and she could feel fulfilled. Yeah. Now, there was another woman you uh, were with um, named Helen. So there were some similar kind of issues, but hers was a little more complicated because it was her children, well, her, her daughter, and a new love interest in, a, in her life. Um, talk about that as, the, and we're sort of carrying on the, the role of the uh, issue of interdependence, but in a different kind of way. Yeah, Helen was a character. Helen lived in the Hebrew home for the aged in, in I guess it's just called the Hebrew home in Riverdale in, mm -hmm. in the Bronx. And she had married her kindergarten friend. You know, they had sort of paired up in kindergarten she had married him. He had really been the only love of her life until she got to this nursing home. And she met a man named Howie Zimmer, who had a severe uh, a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And he was much younger than her, but she was in some ways a little uh, sharper than he was or faster than he was. And they were, uh, the Helen's daughter didn't really feel that this relationship was so great for her mother because she felt Howie was slowing Helen down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would have these, she was just a little quicker than he was. And as I spent time with, with her, I felt that Zoe, the daughter, I understood why she felt this way, but I felt that what Howie gave her was that he needed her and that all his disabilities just meant that he'd need her more. Right. You know, she'd be needed by her husband, by her job, by her kids. And then later on in life, she wasn't quite, didn't feel needed in, the, in that way anymore. But how we needed her and she could take care of him. And, you know, she said, she said, I try to be everything to him. I think that I am. Mm -hmm. And it was so moving to me because imagine wanting to be everything to another person at 90. You can't do the, the things right. you used to do. Wanting to be that everything to somebody and feeling like you got there. Right. You know, right. Uh, what's, you know, think about what a meaningful life is. That's a meaningful life. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you really bring out, John, the element of independence and interdependence. I, I certainly think that one of the issues as one gets older, um, you know, it, especially, you know, that uh, adult children see with their aging parents is that you know, this fear of losing their independence and not wanting to rely on the kids, being a burden to their children. And so um, there is this initial resistance to getting older and, and recognizing that things change. You aren't as vital as you are, but there are opportunities for, you know, a rich life in, in different ways. And this interdependence, I think, is something that you point out that it's sort of giving and take, especially in the issue of caregiving, this becomes an issue of who's taking care of whom and what is each, what is the caregiver and the care recipient giving and, and receiving. And that, you know, even I think you point out in the cases of both these women, that as caregivers, they're getting some, and that the care recipients, um, and as care recipients, they're also, the recipient is also giving 
but that it's harder, as you point out in your book, sometimes the receiving is harder than the giving. It is. And there's a wonderful book by a, a social worker who says, like, for caregivers, if all you're doing is doing things for the other person, you who is, who is in some ways incapacitated, what you're doing is you're creating a debt on their part that they can never pay back. Right. And that's always going to put a pressure on a relationship. But if it can be a give and take, if you can think about what you're getting in return, then it changes the nature of the relationship. And I found this with my mother. My mother died last year, but uh, you know, I was with I was her primary family caregiver mm -hmm. for her last years. And before I had sort of understood this with Ruth and 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 gotten to see it, I thought my job was to do things for my mother, fix some of her problems, help her out with things. Often that just meant like turning her computer on and off, but right. sometimes it would mean more. But right. And I love my mother, so I was happy to do those things, but it became a one-way street. And when I started to rethink it and think about all I was getting from her in return, not in the past, but in the present, when I sat with her, you know, all the knowledge and all the accumulated wisdom I was getting from my mother, all the stories, you know, all the fantastic insights into my mother worked in the newspaper world, you know, in the 50s. So what was that like? And she right. could tell me about that. Uh, as soon as I started to appreciate those things I was getting from her, it, it just deepened our relationship enormously. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's an important lesson. Um, before we get to, we have another break in a few minutes. I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit more about just the issue of uh, living in the in the moment, because this this is a hard thing to do. Um, and, uh, and, and also, um, understanding, as, as you put it, some of your, um, um, as you character, sort of false needs that you add, they're not really false, but they're, they're, they're not really what you ultimately uh, need uh, to make you happy. Um, so talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the idea of um, living the moment, hoping for a longer life, but not forever. Uh, I had this really explained to me nicely by Gloria Steinem, of all people. Oh. She said, you know, she'll be going through an airport and somebody will stop her and say, oh, you're Gloria Steinem, blah, blah, blah. And she, her attitude is, this is probably the only time I'm ever going to speak to this person. Huh. This is a unique opportunity in my life. So I'm going to focus on this person as intently as I can and, and get as much out of this, this brief conversation, mm -hmm. however superficial it might be. I'm going to get as much of this as I out of this as I can. The other way to look at this is to say, I don't know who this person is. Why are they talking to me? I've got a plane to catch. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, so which of those people is having a better day? The one who's annoyed by the person they talk to or the one who pours everything into those, you know, four and a half minutes that they spend together. And that's, I think, what a, a great example of, of living in the moment. Right, right. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that um, it, it makes me think of, too, is um, uh, in one of my previous shows, I interviewed someone, um, a woman named Judy Cornish, who wrote this book called um, Dementia with Dignity. And she talked about, you know, um, basically caring for people with dementia and some of which, you know, surface was some of what you mentioned earlier, which is what each person gets from the relationship to caregiver and care recipient. You know, this is sort of, uh, you know, the extreme, you know, aspects of caregiving when the person has dementia. But she points that, well, if, if you, if, if you're living with this person, if you're experiencing, so these, these are people who really do live just in the moment. You know, they've got a, you know, a, a five second window, you know, there's no future, there's no past, it's, it's, it's in the moment. But if you can appreciate those experiences with them, um, there, there is an emotional, there's not a, a rational uh, process, but there's an emotional component to living in the moment. And, and you can really appreciate that and go through their, your experience with them. You know, it, it again, it relieves you, as you said, of, you know, trying to take care of this person, try to fulfill this or manage them as a project versus really appreciating what life is like really in the moment. Yeah. 
that's a, that's a wonderful insight on her part. But and and to shift this a little bit, you know, we all woke up this morning. You know, if you woke up with your your partner, did you start the day by kissing that person <laughs> or not? You know, we can. If you didn't, why didn't you? You know, did you call that friend of yours that you're concerned that they're becoming isolated? Did we do these things? We, you know, we actually know what the things are that make us feel better, but but so often we don't do them. We all know a lot of the things that make us feel worse, and yet we do them. Right. So, right. right. We do them because they they're familiar to us, even though we know they're terrible. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah they're. The, the the fear of the unknown is, is is greater than the pain of of the known you know that's one of my uh, little aphorisms i see and i will people have a hard time changing well when do they change well often they change when the the pain of not changing exceeds the fear of change you know and then they will um uh so you you have a lot of lessons that you learned uh, in the book and, and uh, before we get to them uh, i know we're heading for another break in a few minutes but uh, i just wanted to mention um uh just take a step back and, and say that um i did really enjoy reading the book john i mean it really i i uh, i recommend to people to to really pick it up um you know i'm a, a former newspaper journalist and i uh, as i read the story you know i really uh, enjoyed your approach and your style it's it's uh you know it's it's a repertorial style you 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 blend it with research about aging and aging experts and the, as a greater context but you travel along um the, you, you know you the reader feels that they're traveling along with you in a journey with these six people and um you know it's both compassionate and objective and uh you know i think that uh, you know, it's a little bit, uh, you know, from my perspective, my history, it's sort of like, you know, the new journalism, you know, being not afraid to, you know, use the I word as in I, <laughs> I'm in this story, recognize I'm in this story, not, you know, this reporter or some, some omniscient, you know, narrator. Um, and uh, I thought it was beautifully blend, blended and I thought it was a really compelling read. So I really thank you for doing that and, and you know, taking the time to do it. I think that, you know, I, I know with some, you know, newspaper you know, editors having experienced myself, it's hard to get the time to spend with people like that and just see what unfolds. So I think that just being able to spend the time doing that, you know, was a, you know, a, a revealing process. So I'm, I'm glad that you <laughs> had that opportunity. Well, I'm so grateful that the Times let me do this. And, you know, as my approach to the book was, I had the opportunity to meet these six people and they were really meaningful in my life. I'm going to introduce you to them. And, and if I could do that, if you could meet these six incredible people, uh, you know, then I'm halfway there. Right. Right. Yeah. But I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, um, you know, you, you, you did a, a you know, a, a terrific blending job and what I know, um, you know, the, the, the effortlessness with which it reads is something that uh, one of my writing mentors from years ago, a guy named Bill Zinzer, who wrote this book called On Writing Well. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, one of the things I, I remember his telling me um, was, um, you know, the easier it is to read, the harder the reporter, the writer probably had to make it that way. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate all the work that you and your editors did, you know, to, to get to, to deliver the story to us. Well, I think the people did, that I wrote about did all the hard work, and what I had to do was keep them from bumping into each other. <laughs> give them, give them a place to work. Give them a nice workspace to work in. Right, right. Okay. Well, listen. So we're we're gonna when we when we come back from a break, we're gonna go on a break in a minute. But when we come back from a break, we're gonna talk in our last segment about all the lessons you felt you learned from this. You know, kind of. Uh, parse out some of them. Uh, there are many of them who we'll probably won't be able to fit all of them. But uh, uh, so folks, uh, we're going to take another quick break, two minutes. And when we come back, we'll be uh, much more in our last segment with John Leland, the author of Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old. Welcome back, folks. We're talking today with uh, John Leland, a uh, reporter for the New York Times and author of Happiness is a Choice We Make. Um, uh, in our last segment, uh, I wanted to just ask John, uh, he spent a year with um, uh, reporting on the lives of six people, 85 and older, which resulted in the book. Uh, and um, he, he mentions uh, the book is divided into 
in uh, two parts, basically. One sort of um, uh, chronicles of these six people, and then another part two about the lessons he learned. Uh, so let's just talk about some of the lessons, John. What, well, let's start with a, a few that you think are the most uh, salient for yourself. I think one of the easiest was the ones I learned from Fred Jones, which we talked about before, that daily practice of gratitude. You know, Fred said, my favorite part of the day is waking up in the morning and saying, thank God for another day on my way to 110. Right. And just, you know, it's a reminder that gratitude isn't, you got something nice and you say, thank you for it. Gratitude is just living with gratitude daily, that this, that a, another day is a gift that we can give, give thanks for. And we can, and, and once we valued it and given thanks for it, we can use it well. So that's Fred. Helen Moses, we talked about her and Howie before, measuring yourself by how useful you are to other people, mm -hmm. not by what they do for you. And, you know, there's, there's incredible research on that uh, acts of altruism, doing good things for other people, uh, is one of the best things you can do for your emotional strength. If you learn nothing else, those two things are, are, are wonderful. Uh, one of the other people in the series and the, and the book is Jonas Mekas, the filmmaker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Jonas lived with an incredible sense of purpose all the time. And he, and he was very uh, literal about it. He said, my sense of purpose is to create beauty in the world. That's what I'm here for. Some people create this, some people create that. I create beauty. And again, there's a tremendous amount of research that people who say they have a purpose in life, that what they do matters, uh, have much better emotional and physical health outcomes th th than others. Uh, Ruth, we talked about, that sense of interdependence, letting people help you and giving them something in return, creating that, that mutually beneficial cycle. Uh, Ping, who couldn't do a lot of the things she did, she said, I never think about the things I can't reach. The only thing I have to do is, in, I, so she said, I know my time is limited. So the only thing I have to do is enjoy myself. Like Mahjong, I will do it until my last day. So again, living for what you can do, not brooding over what you can't do. And the last person who we haven't really talked about is John Sorensen. Mm -hmm. And John was a, a gay man who had lost his partner of 60 years. And he had lost a lot of his eyesight and his mobility and, and his ability to play the piano, which were things that were really valuable to him. And so John uh, would, would say, often when we got together, he'd say that he wanted to die. But, but yet John found ways to, uh, to enjoy the things that he did. Because John wanted to die, when this Metropolitan Saturday Opera broadcast came on, he, he treated it as if it might be his last. When he had a conversation with you, like Gloria Steinem earlier, he treated it as if it might be his last. So he was enjoying his operas more than I was. He was getting more out of these, his conversations than I did because he knew his time was finite. He lived as if his time was finite. And so those moments were incredibly valuable to them because they were limited in number. Right, right. Yeah, I think that you, you mentioned that um, to me in our previous conversation that, you know, the book was intended uh, really for people kind of our age, younger people to basically as a, I mean, uh, as like, why can't we do this now? <laughs> you know, why, why these are things, lessons that we can learn now. I felt myself completely changed as a person as a result of spending the year with these people for that initial series in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. When the series was over at the end of the year, it looked like that was the end of it. And I was feeling, in some ways, at a loss without this. And I was trying to figure out why. Right. And what was it? What was I, I was missing. I was missing them. And I was missing not just the people, because the people were great, but I was missing sort of the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the approach to life that I was getting from mm -hmm. them. And I wrote the book really about, I wrote the series to try to figure out what life looked like at 85 to the people right. who were living it. And then the book is trying to say what I learned from them at my age, which was a mere 55 at the time. And, uh, you know, how we can use some of that wisdom now. I right. wish I'd had it when I was 20, but of right. course I wouldn't have listened to it. 
Right, right. Um, but one of the things that um, you know struck me about it does, um, yes. Yeah, so, so you mentioned to me that that obviously yes. So when you're in twenties, you're experiencing life, and it says like, well, I'm going to experience life as it is now. And and whether you can listen to the wisdom of someone eighty five um, is like, well, part of it is just you need to, to lead your life. Um, and yet, um, what I found interesting too, um, you know, a, a few years ago. Um, I was at uh, uh, a, a college reunion at Yale, um, and I was, uh, uh, in a, you know, there were a bunch of seminars there that would bring in for alumni, and one of them was by this woman, uh, Lori Santos, who has become a, sort of a rock star, you know, um, um, uh, talking about, um, you know, the well, well, well-being and the good life, and her her seminar was sort of the happiness, you know, seminar. Um, but one of the surprises was that, um, you, know, she, you know, she explained sort of the origin story of this course. And she said it was, you know, she was, you know, uh, basically uh, the, uh, the head of a college there dealing with a lot of students. And they were, um, you know, they were, you know, the, the, these are bright, you know, the best and the brightest and, you know, uh, f- futures with no limit and, uh, you know, and, and certain amount of privilege, but, you know, very ambitious and they were miserable. And she was like, what's going on here? Why are these, you know, kids so miserable and stressed out? And so she started, you know, working on a course, uh, dealing with, it was dubbed the happiness course, but it was like, well, how do you, you know, what's, what's meaningful in your life and how do you find it? So it became kind of a, you know, um, uh, an unexpected, uh, um, uh, explosive success where now and then it became you know the most uh enrolled course in the history of the college um so i think that you know it's true that this is but but the same sort of lessons you know to the extent that they could pay attention to them and she gave them assignments to sort of at least force them through it were kind of lessons that that you picked up too about what is what is meaning and purpose in life you know and 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 you know again the issues of gratitude but connection and so forth so I think this uh, has a lot of residents all across the generations. I think she's fantastic, and I think her work is is, is wonderful. Uh, and I find it really interesting that we came to the same conclusions, recipes for happiness, from entirely different angles. You know, she came at it through eighteen year olds. I came at it through eighty eight year olds. Right. And yet, yet we end up in the same place. And I think that that tells you something. That we're all we're we know the things that make us feel better we all we all know what they are yeah yeah and and we don't do them and why is that yeah yeah i think that uh, one of the th- interesting um uh, surprises for me was um you know just going through a lot of my papers and decluttering my house i came across some some of my my father's you know writings and documents and so i came across this uh you know four page um paper called all in all how happy are you <laughs> so, so this uh-huh. is something that he had actually i've looked at him like okay so he was in his 60s when he wrote this and um my father was an engineer and so he you know he, he took a, he's an engineering approach so right he, so he parses out happiness but interestingly along similar lines the way you you just you know describe them i mean he, he goes through some of the initial okay are your physical needs met you know or are you you know you know are you do you feel safe? Do you feel that you know you're, um, you know, you're not hungry? You're not so forth. So there are those physical, um, I guess you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm-hmm. But then he talks about you know these issues about you know your feeling of of, of self and, fe- and 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 purpose and meaning. So I'm like, wow, okay, <laughs> you know this this is an enduring exploration. This 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 uh, pursuit of the fountain of happiness is something that I think that. Uh, we actually can find as opposed to the fountain of youth. <laughs> so, you know, and it's great that your father came to that because probably in the years that he did, the idea of men talking about meaning and purpose and happiness was a little bit alien. And he's comes, you know, set uh, to his own devices with a piece of paper. Those are the things he comes up with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of it, you know, some of these things are driven, I think, um, like the people you interviewed somewhat by loss. I think in, he had a mid-career obstacle that many people, uh, engineers in his generation did when they were 
you know, they, they, they worked for the aerospace and defense industry and which went through a series of, you know, booms and busts. And I think that um, uh, some of his bus period, I think, you know, created a sense of reflection, you know, in terms of what really mattered, what really made him happy. It wasn't just the achievement on the job, you know, that was that. Uh, so, yeah, I was, I, I was grateful to find that paper. <laughs> Um, well, if you're really successful at doing something you don't like, you're not going to be as happy as being uh, doing something that you, you really love and maybe middling at it. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the last thing I mentioned that you've mentioned to me, which I think kind of encapsulated, and I, uh, I'm just going to quote a little bit from you. So we don't have to go out and seek happiness. The good things in life, happiness, purpose, contentment, companionship, love have been there all along. We don't need to earn them. Good food, friends, art, uh, warmth, worth. These are all things we have already. We just need to choose them as our lives. Whatever aches I had or fears are still with me, but as supporting instruments in my, in my soundtrack, not as the music itself. Wine helps. <laughs> I couldn't, yes. <laughs> I like that last Philip, but, but anyway. Yeah, I I'm, think that, go ahead, John, yeah. I'm not proselytizing for wine, but. There are times when something, doing something nice for yourself. Does right. Help. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's, that to me sort of encapsulated the a message for me, you know, that, that, that the, these things are available um, throughout your life, but just uh, choose them. And know? that's what I mean when I say happiness is a choice you make. Right. Right. We can, stuff's going to happen to us. Right. Right. Like I said, saying stuff happens. Right. It just does. <laughs> right. But we do have a say in how we think about it. Right. And that's, I think, really meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're coming up to the close, John. Unfortunately, it went quickly. Um, um, maybe um, uh, in the future, we can continue our conversation with uh, perhaps an epilogue to your epilogue. <laughs> you know, this is certainly something that uh, is, is a lot of stuff that I, and I'd like to continue our conversation. Um, but I want to thank you to, for a terrific conversation today. Um, and uh, if people have questions for you, can they, is there a contact or, I mean, I know that you have a LinkedIn page. Is, are there ways people? I'm just people? lelandhappiness at gmail.com. Okay. It happens to you. Very good. Okay. Um, so I just want to mention folks, if, uh, if you missed my conversation with John today, you can still listen to it as a podcast on voiceamerica.com or search for it on my, uh, uh, Crowell resources page. Just click the 45 forward tab. You can also find it on Apple and Google podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Um, so, um, if you have comments or questions, you also can email me at, at ron.rowell at gmail.com. Uh, so, folks, uh, be sure to join me next Monday, 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time, when I'll be doing my one-year anniversary show, sharing with you, my listeners, uh, the highlights of this year, the lessons I've learned, some of my ideas and hopes for engaging and provocative shows in the coming year, like the one we just shared with John Lehman. So, um, until then, folks, keep moving forward, 45 forward.